Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and I'm going to start things out this week with some hippie shit. If you listen to this show, you know I love going to see different versions of The Grateful Dead with my high school buddy, Steve. Now, I do like some of the Dead's music, but I don't really actively listen to them. The reason I've been going to shows is all about nostalgia. They remind me of the fun I had seeing them in college, and that was more about the party in the parking lot than the music. I mean, my musical tastes revolve around punk rock, metal, and old school rap. I like my music fast and loud, so I've never really been into jam bands. But when my buddy Malone Camp called me up and he was like, hey, I'm coming up to Seattle and taking you to your first Goose show, I was like, hell yeah, I'll never turn down a concert with a good friend. And while Malone and I don't go way back, he's quickly become a good friend. And I should mention that he's also the lawyer for Mountain Gazette. If you don't subscribe to that, you should check it out. It is a large format magazine that Mike Rogge created, and it is pretty amazing. Anyways, I knew Malone had a connection to the band. He was friends with one of the dudes in there, and that's pretty much all I knew. And to prepare for the show, I asked Malone to send me a couple of playlists so I could get familiar with their music. And I listened to them for a week or so, so I wouldn't be coming in totally blind. We saw the show on a Saturday, and Malone had seen Goose the night before in Montana, and then did a crazy flight over here to Seattle that got him here at 6.30 in the morning on three hours of sleep. I picked him up from the airport, I took him to Easy Street Records for breakfast, and if you come to Seattle and you like music and you like to eat, you have to check out Easy Street. It's one of the few iconic record stores left in the country, and I'm lucky to have it down the street from my house. So. After breakfast, I take Malone to his hotel so he can get a couple hours of sleep, and here's where things get good. Malone calls me when he got up, and he's like, we should get to the venue early. Let's leave around one. I'm like, who gets to a show six hours early? I don't know, but I'm along for the ride, so I pick up Malone, and we head to the venue. The whole time we're in the car, he's texting with his friend Jeff, who's in the band, and their tour manager, Sammy. I figured we'd get there, we'd get into a VIP area, and we'd have some drinks or something. But no. We end up back in the outdoor catering and green room area around 2 o'clock. And there are about 20 people there that I met, and I have no idea who's who and who does what, and I don't care. Everyone was just another regular person, it seemed like. And they all knew and loved Malone. The second we walked up, everybody was all about him, it seemed like. And they're asking about skiing in Japan and talking about disc golf. And we're all just sitting around eating salmon, chicken, and broccoli and shooting the shit for a few hours conversation was easy with these dudes and there was no music talk whatsoever. Eventually, everyone went off and prepared to do their jobs, sound checks and all that other stuff, and Malone and I headed into the venue around 6. When the band took the stage, my mind was absolutely blown. The people that we spent most of our time with all day were in the band. The show was incredible and they pretty much played all the songs I knew from Malone's playlist. When they played the one song I'd listened to more than any other, Hunger Sight, a dude in front of me turns around and looks at me and he's like, I've seen Goose play eight times and I've been waiting to hear this song. So I felt pretty lucky that I got to hear the songs that I wanted to hear. And then after the show, we went on the tour bus, hung out with Jeff there, and then went to the green room and the whole band was there. And I let him know, man, earlier we were all hanging out. I had no idea who was in the band or who was a photographer or who was a tech. And I really didn't care. I was just making friends with you all, and you were all good people, and you seemed like regular, normal dudes. And then when you took the stage, I was like, holy shit, those people that I thought were regular guys that I was eating salmon with were actually some of the most talented musicians on the planet. I think they knew that I didn't know what I was getting into when I was coming to the show, and they genuinely appreciated what I had to say about them. When they were about to leave the green room area, I fanned out, and I was like, hey guys, since everyone's here, can I get a picture with you? And it was just like asking a group of friends on a trip to take a photo. So thank you, Goose, for that incredible experience. But who I need to thank more than Goose is Malone Camp. The travel that he did to get to this show was kind of crazy, and he didn't need to come see this one. He's seen the band over 40 times, and is seeing him three more times on this tour. But now that I think about it, Malone knows the shit I've been going through over the past two years. And if you don't know, well, my wife has stage four cancer, and it's made life miserable, emotional, and sad. So I really think Malone did all of this to make me forget about the shitty part of my life for a day. And that really means so much to me, and it totally worked. So thank you, Malone. While Goose was a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience, I've had a lot more experiences with my guests this week. It's part two with ski filmmaking legend Johnny DeCesare, and we pick up where we left off last, in Whistler with Shane Zox, 
when the new school movement of skiing was just starting. Before we get into it, I want to thank all of you for listening. I want to ask you to tell a friend about the show as it really does help things grow. Also, if you have any questions or concerns or guest suggestions, you can email me at mike at the and I will get back to you. Finally, please support my incredible sponsors who make this podcast happen. They are Outdoor Research, Elon Skis, Best Day Brewing, Stanley, and Club Med. Now, it's time for part two with Johnny DeCesare. I want to kick off part two by getting way ahead of myself again. I always do that. And you've put out so many movies and you've worked with so many iconic brands. But two that really put their money where their mouth was, was Oakley and Red Bull. And when you think of the most insane, big budget movie premieres that you've had over the years with one of your films, what would that be? Who was there? And describe the night. Holy moly. Yeah, those are two big brands. Those guys are awesome. Okay, describe. It was the Oakley 1242 premiere for sure. I mean, there was two big premieres, like two really big ones. But I would say the Oakley 1242 premiere was like pretty next level. It was at the Oakley factory in Irvine. And we basically burned the place down. It was pretty sick. I mean, just like an incredible party where they let anything go? Kind of. Actually, there was two of them. When we did 13, that was actually the first one at the Oakley headquarters. And that one, actually, the place got burned down. Actually, we got banned from doing (laughs) premieres there for a while. Okay. And what gets you banned from something like that? Because you're all young. I mean, you're a little bit older than all the athletes, but not that much older. And you all like to have a good time. What gets you banned? Just going a little too big? Yeah, they were just going huge. I mean, I looked up at one point and Vincent Dorian was on top of the security guard's shoulders and he was dancing down the aisle, like down the middle of the place. And Philippe Poirier became the bartender. And yeah, I don't know. It was just going off. I can't remember exactly what happened. J.P. Claire was getting crazy. Everyone was there and it was just a free for all. I mean, they opened up the lobby because they have like a mini theater that holds a couple hundred people. And that theater was absolutely packed. And then when the, the when the movie's over, they open the doors and you're basically in their lobby. And it's a really freaking cool lobby. But they have like merchandise and like stuff. Like It's just their lobby. I mean, it was it was insane. And they turned the information desk there, you know, where they would send you upstairs to yep. someone's office or something. That was like a bar. And then there was another bar serving beer and another bar. I don't know. It just it, it got totally wild. It was pretty nuts. And they were like, OK, no more poor boys for a while. We're taking a break. And so that's probably like 98, 99 or something like that. But then, yeah, exactly. two, then 2003, they let you back with 1242? Yeah, because it was their own film. So they decided to let us back. But they actually had like three or four years where they didn't do any premieres. They actually banned all premieres. So we kind of wrecked it for everyone. <laughs> when you think of big premieres like the one you had at Oakley, does that kind of stuff get the attention of audiences and media outside of skiing? Like, are there actual famous people there? It was pretty cool. Yeah, I can't remember exactly who showed up. There were some pretty rad superstars there. And I think, you know, moving forward, it definitely opened the door for us for a lot more projects. That was big. It was actually kind of like legendary. I think that was the premiere that turned the tide. They actually started doing all their premieres there in 1242 afterwards. So it opened doors for all over the place. That happens. And then something that you were known for and a lot of the movie companies were known for was a big movie tour. I think a lot of the Poor Boys tours, you know, in the early 2000s were called the Triple Threat Tour. And there'd be a few different movies, the Poor Boys one being the feature. And when you think about that, did you ever go on those tours or did you try to distance yourself from them? I did in the beginning and I would go to the first few, but then I would have to like come back home because at that point when we were doing Triple Threat, I was like married and I had a daughter. But I mean, the premieres, I used to go to all the premieres in the beginning. Like I would go to as many as I could, but we would also try and have as many as we can. And Cody Carter basically packed up a truck and he would go. And he created Triple Threat. He created the Triple Threat tour. Cody did. And he's a Seattle-based guy, you know, so we had some massive premieres out of Seattle. And when Cody's on the road touring your movies with the Triple Threat, do you ever get those calls in the middle of the night like, oh shit, Johnny, we've got a problem? Yeah. Plenty of those calls. I don't remember exactly which ones they were, but we had plenty of those phone calls. 
either the movie didn't work or something happened with someone and see it there is always something happening do you have any specifics you want to like enlighten me with that you want to no, I was just throwing it out there. I do remember when the projector did break. I think I was actually an MC of one of those tours when it was like in early September or mid-September and it was like 100 degrees outside in Seattle and everything just shut down and we could not get the movie to go and everything was overheating and that just sucked. But I think eventually things worked out. Hey, I remember that. That was actually in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. I think I was on the mic for it. It was like 105 degrees. It was It was crazy. There was a zillion people at that premiere, too. I think it was totally sold out. All your premieres seemed to be like that back then because it was just so popular and everything was kind of firing. But we're going to take it back to where we left off last time. And we stopped with X Games not including skiing. You were really bummed on that. And that experience created the name for your next movie, State of Mind. And, I mean, when you're at X, had you already seen the footage from the Canadian guys? And you know in your heart that you're going to change skiing with the the footage you're going to get from those dudes? Um, no. I don't think I had met those guys yet. Oh, SIA was after X? SIA was after X. So you're bummed on how it's being covered. You have the idea for State of Mind. Then you meet Shane, and that's kind of where we left off before. And Shane invited you to Whistler. And these days, if you look back at influential people in skiing, Shane's arguably one of the most influential of all time, especially of the new school. But it's not just for his skiing. It was for his vision of what things could be. On top of that, Shane Zox always had the best setup in Whistler. What was his life like when you stayed with him in those early days? Oh, it was crazy. We stayed at this place. So first of all, he didn't actually think I'd show up, which is really funny because, you know, he like he was being Canadian and Canadians are like as nice as they get. Yeah, they're like the nicest people on the planet. And back then they were even nicer. Like it was just crazy. It was like, oh, you should come out. We can film together. You know, that would be awesome. You're always welcome at my place. I'll come and pick you up from the airport. And I was like, okay. And I was a guy that was like, I don't know. I was crazy. I I didn't care. Okay, you invited me. I'm coming. Let's go. You know? And so I did. I told him I was coming. He picked me up from the airport. Actually, it was Glenn Middendorfer who picked me up from the airport. I think Shane, too. And we drove back up and we stayed at this place called the Mushroom House. No, it wasn't the Mushroom House. It was the, uh, oh, what was the name of it? Uh, There was the Mushroom House and then his other house. It was crazy. It had all these different themed rooms. And it was his father's cabin up in Whistler. And it was insane. It was so good. And all the guys were staying there. Like everyone had like their own room almost. It was it was incredible. His parents weren't there. It was just like Shane's. He had the setup. It was the best setup in the world. And then he had this group. And the group was core. It was it was really cool. Who was that group originally? Like, who were those people living in his house that first year? Well, some of the guys were away. So J.F. Cousin, J.P. Eau Claire, and Vincent were not there. And we had some of the other guys, the early guys, like Glenn Mittendorfer and Shane. And there was a bunch of them. But it was like a group of like eight. And they took me all over the mountain. And they showed me, oh, this is the wind lip. And this is this. And it was snowing every day. It was like overcast and snowing. And I was like all right, when's the sun going to come out? And they were like, oh, yeah, about that. And I'm like, what do you mean, oh, yeah, about that? And so they enlightened me on how it just basically is never sunny in Whistler, it seemed like. And after nine days, the very last day, the sun broke out, and we hit everything we possibly could. You know, we built it before, and then we hit it. And it was all on mountain, pretty much, or side mountain. So that whole first trip, you only had one day of shooting? Basically, it was like two days. Yeah, two days of shooting at most. But those guys were gnarly. It was sick. And then I was like, okay, we're going to shoot more. And then I went up for summer and Mike Douglas sent me a bunch of footage. And he's like, you got to have JP in the movie. And he showed me all these clips. And Shane and those guys had a video camera as well. And they were shooting. And at the end of the year... Everyone gave me all the footage. And Mike Douglas was super influential. He was there. So he was there. And when we did the windlip session, he landed like six inches for me on like what I had ever filmed as the first ever Misty Flip coming right at me, like wide angle, sitting down below the windlip. And he popped it. It was super tight, perfect. And he landed right next to me. Poof. And I was like, wow, that was a sick shot. And Shane was doing these crazy corked out things. 
and he did Misty's and it was wild. It was like stuff I'd never seen before. And we did the quarter pipe. He did some other cool stuff that I couldn't believe. And these guys were doing like mute grabs with tweaks and all kinds of cool stuff. And I was completely mind blown and infatuated. And I was like, these are the guys. These are the freaking guys. These are the guys that are going to change Skeen's image. And then when I received all the footage from Mike later that summer, that was it. We put together State of Mind and that was like, okay, this is the new state of mind. This is the mindset that we're going to take forward in skiing and we're going to show people how rad it is and where it's going. And we're just as good as anyone else, including snowboarders. Because at the time, it was like snowboarders versus skiers. Like they hated us and we hated them, even though we're all one now. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, they hated you and you hated them, but there's no doubt that what snowboarding was doing was influencing this new style of skiing. And were they more pissed at you guys for biting their style or for poaching their parks? Yeah, poaching the parks. They thought we were goofy, you know, they didn't care. They were just like, oh, those guys are stupid. They're trying to do cool tricks like us, but we're already doing the cool tricks. They're just copycats. But really, we had been doing cool tricks for a long time. It was just that they had a different style because they were on one board instead of two. So it was obvious they were doing some other stuff, but it, it was very influential. It was necessary for the ski industry. And I think in the end, it created something super incredible within our group. And, and that just spread like wildfire. And it was, you know, a very short time afterwards where we were doing pretty much everything everyone else was doing on one board. And I mean, it sounds like the beginning of the movement happens like three or four years before any of this. Like Douglas and Zox see J.F. Goussaint doing a 360 mute grab years before Mosley made that a household name. From what you gather, was that the start of it? Yeah, the 360 mute from Goussaint was pretty much as influential as it gets. Also, Chris Ostinus, who I wasn't working with at the time, he was also doing really cool stuff. It just was hard to see it. It wasn't like out there to show the world but he actually had some rad stuff going at the same time kind of like grabs and whatnot and different style of skiing but basically for my group yeah kusan and those guys were absolutely the forerunners of everything and for you you were a professional mogul skier and then you can made fade to black and then you make state of mind how does professional moguls end for you? Do you realize that you've got this crew and everything's going to be about filming this crew and making movies and you just retire from pro skiing? Pretty much. I mean, the thing is, I stayed on the mogul tour because Zox and all those guys ended up on the mogul tour. So they started doing events, even though they sometimes had fake names and whatnot, so they wouldn't get kicked off the national team. <laughs> they would, I remember in Snowbird, all those guys had like fake names and I had the footage, but I didn't know it was Shane Zox at the time. It was before I had met him, which is super cool. And we had a lot of things to talk about. And then we ended up filming and he stayed on the pro tour and JP and those guys were doing the Canadian thing for a little while, but then if they didn't make the team or whatever, they ended up quitting. And this whole new school thing started going. And I was like, Hey, we're going to make a full fledged film next year. And I'm not going to do the tour. I am just going to freaking go for it. So that's when I bought my personal first camera. We had had the other camera that Eric had shot, my partner, which was a DB cam recorder. Just like the small little one? Yeah. And then I bought the VX700, which was like the first ever digital camera. So it was like a one chip digital camera. First one with the handle? Yeah. It was like small but it wasn't film, it was digital. And I remember that's when we made Degenerates that was more mass produced and like had actual distribution and stuff. Before we get ahead of ourselves, when I think about State of Mind, it's just that one trip that you have, then you get all that footage from Douglas. So it's not like you've had a full year to film with these guys and it's not like you're hanging out with these guys all the time. But when you were in Whistler and you had those nine days there, you've got the same interests as all these guys. You're a mogul guy, they're a mogul guys. And you're into this new, new school movement. So are they. They're founding it and starting it. And do you immediately almost become an honorary member of the new Canadian Air Force before it even had a name? Like, did they make you part of that whole crew? I was definitely became good friends with Shane. Like, Shane and I were, like, tight. We became really good friends. And with Glenn and that whole little crew, I missed those guys the minute I left. I was like, oh, this was, like, 
the most epic time of my life. And I knew it was one of the most epic times of my life. And I knew I had something special. And I knew that that group was going to change a lot of things. Like I, I had a vision, I knew. And they knew too. They were like, hey, this guy's the only one who's willing to film us. Like he's the only one who cares. At that point, I was. I was like the only guy who cared. Like MSP didn't care about those guys. They didn't want nothing to do with like freestyle mogul dudes. That was the last thing they wanted to do was hang out with freestyle mogul guys, you know? Yeah. They were big mountain backcountry dudes. And so was TGR. They had no freestyle in it whatsoever, and neither did MSP. So <laughs> that was their last choice <laughs> and their only choice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, honorary member, I would say yes. They weren't called the Canadian Air Force yet, but they were about to explode. And when the movie comes out, was it one of those things where the core of the industry, they actually know that you're onto something or were people just confused by what they were seeing? Freeze Magazine had a article that did reviews and it was a really cool review by Slave Boy. Slave Boy was, well, it was Micah Abrams, AKA Slave Boy. Okay. And he had this really cool review on State of Mind and I can't remember how he got a copy, but he got a copy and it was in the magazine. I think that was when it was in freeze. Yeah. You're on the right track. Yes. I'm on right. Or that was, was it degenerates? No, no, it was, it was that one. It was like where he pretty much said that you were almost going to lose your talent if you didn't start shooting better or something like that. Yeah. He was like, you better get a new camera and start shooting. <laughs> Man, I wish I had that in front of me, but he did have something to say that was super cool. And he did say, I better get my act together and learn how to shoot. So that's when it all started, basically. And then the next season was Degenerates. And I linked up with this company in Vail. It was Highline Productions. And my good friends, Jeff and the crew, they were like, okay, we're going to help you distribute it. Now you got to get a sponsor. And I was like, okay, well, sponsor. Yeah, sponsor. Somebody's got to pay for this. We, gotta, we, we need money to do this. Because I wanted to do it real. I wanted to travel. I wanted to make this film. I wanted to make it bigger than life. I wanted to have better quality. So what I did was I went to SIA again, except this time I went with my state of mind video with a plan to ask everyone in the industry for money. Now it's time for my first sponsor break. And I'm so stoked to have Club Med sponsor the podcast. And while some of you may be thinking, Club Med, isn't that for the best island vacations? Yes, while they offer the all-inclusive luxury experience in the islands, they're the only all-inclusive brand to offer mountain resorts globally. That's right, you can ditch the hassle of planning your ski vacation of a lifetime on your own and do it the Club Med way and book one of their trips to the snowy peaks of Europe, Japan, China, or Canada. When you travel with Club Med, you'll enjoy unlimited lift tickets, lessons for all levels, delicious meals, and endless apre ski fun, all included in the price. And while your kids are having a blast at the supervised children's clubs, you can focus on mastering your skiing or apre skills and creating unforgettable memories. To make it all happen for you or your family, visit clubmed.us or call 1-800-CLUB-MED or your travel advisor to experience ski without limits. Next up, it's Elon Skis. And while I've been talking about Elon all summer, I've been keeping some information from you that I'll share today. The award-winning ski that started Elon's cult following here in the U.S., the Ripstick, is brand new for 24-25. Think all new molds, all new sizes, new widths, and new tech. I got to ski these skis last season, and I'll say, the new models are still lightweight, they still have a ton of pop, and they'll still make you a better skier. But these new skis are even more stable at speed, which will allow them to handle burlier terrain than ever before. While you get more out of the Ripstick collection, Elon was able to build them without making them more demanding. So Ripstick fits even more skiers than before. While I loved my original Ripstick, what I skied last year was noticeably more fun, and I know the cult of Elon is going to grow even more with this new collection. If you're a person that demos skis and you haven't tried an Elon yet, make sure you try one this year and you'll feel how fun these skis are. To find out more about all things Elon, head on over to elonskis.com. My final sponsor this round is Stanley, and they've been supporting this podcast for years before they became the hottest brand in America. Why did I want to work with Stanley? Because Stanley's products are light years better than the competition. While everyone knows about their quencher, which is everywhere, I swear by their adventure stacking beer pint glasses, and I use them every day. And when ski season comes around, 
I use Stanley's food jars and lunch boxes and bring them to the mountain to save me from buying $25 burgers. It's the ultimate saving money hack at the mountain. And Stanley's the brand that invented the category of keeping things hot and cold, and they've been doing it for over 100 years, so you know you're getting the best when you buy a Stanley. To find out more about all their products and collections, head on over to Stanley1913.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. So you go to SIA, you shop it around to everyone, you get Hart, who you're already on, and they're like, yeah, we're going to back you, Johnny. We like what you're doing. So State of Mind helps you sell that one in. And now that you've got sponsors and you've got all these things going on and you're planning degenerates. Hey, but I remember something now, too, is that the biggest sponsor we had, actually, who actually gave me money for degenerates and actually took us around because they were all on his clothing was B of A. And it was Hiro Kobayashi. And he's the one who I have to give him huge credit because he's the one who had sponsored all these kids. And the, the guys like Shane and all those guys were sponsored by B of A. And they were the ones who turned me on to him. And he was the one who actually took us to Japan. And so we went to Japan with J.P. Eau Claire, Vincent Dorian, Kusan, and Sox. Okay. And they created like a mogul event, but they also made this like freestyle thing like almost like a slope style course. And it was insanity. That's when JF Kusan did like a switch backflip and it was nuts. I mean, you think about the industry. I mean, there's a point here where there's momentum for all of these athletes because people see state of mind and people are starting to get excited, but there's no product out there that these athletes can actually land switch on. Were you in the behind the scenes conversations that led to the birth of Twin Tips? Like was everybody talking about what they wanted to do and then bringing those ideas to their sponsors? In Degenerates, everyone wanted twins. Zox was bending his skis and he was waiting for a pair of twins and they came from K2. Yeah, so Zox was waiting for skis and they ended up coming through K2 and that was insane. It was like, oh, but they were really short. They were super short. They were way shorter than I anticipated, but they worked. And Vinny tried them and Vincent Dorian was like, dude, we got to make these. And I knew that Solomon was onto it. And the guys like Mike D, who was super influential in creating the um, 1080 and JP and Kusan, they were all involved in it. And the actual first pair ever that I saw in person that I think the world saw, to be honest with you, it was the first time anyone had seen it, was at Freeze Magazine's event in Vail, Colorado. And that was the moment. That was like it. No one skied on it there. That was one of those things where it like showed up late, right? Yeah, they showed up late. Kusan and JP both won categories. One won slope style, one won best trick, like big air. And when JP came on stage, the ski had landed that day and he showed the world and he held it up above his head. And it's like this iconic video shot and also a photo of him holding the 1080s up over his head. And that was the moment. And then when those guys got those things clicked in and they got bindings on them, it went nuts. And we had an amazing week in Vail. We had like 10 days together, the crew, and we built jumps, road gaps. JP did the first ever like Misty in the half pipe. And sometimes 10 days can be like three months, you know, and those 10 days were so progressive. And I remember it was the first time I ever got to like spend a lot of time with JP Eau Claire. And we hit it off really well. And I remember him saying, I've got this trick I'm going to make. And it's going to be like a McTwist in the half pipe. And we filmed and filmed and filmed and filmed and he made it. It was insanity. It was truly next level stuff for the half pipe. You talk about JP. And when you think about visionary people, I talked about Zox as well. And he's a total visionary. But JP was one of those special skiers that kind of just transcended the sport. It seemed like he was an artist, a really thoughtful person. and. What made him different than the rest of that whole crew? Because he seemed like an outlier that was really special. I mean, they were all special in their own way. And JP's was this like, if he had a task, he would never, ever not finish it. Like, he would kill himself before he'd finish it. You know what I mean? He would like stay up all night for five nights in a row until he finished the task, if he had to finish the task. Yep. You know, everyone else would be like, ah, Kusan, we couldn't even get him out of bed. You know, Dorian was like, eh, dude. So 
it was just like this crazy bunch of characters, but JP was really on point. He knew where we wanted to go. He was focused on it, which Zox was as well. But JP had something totally different. They were both totally different. But JP had this vision of the art side of skiing. It's like he wanted everything to be different. Okay. And by the time the 1080 comes to market, the new Canadian Air Force is the talk of the ski industry. Do you remember when they got the name the new Canadian Air Force and who actually coined that term? I just remember there was this photo. It was like the cover of Freeze magazine. And it was all of them. I don't know if I was on it or not. I can't remember. But there was a cover with the entire Canadian Air Force on the front. And it was pretty cool. It was like the coming out party. And Freeze kind of coined it? I think Freeze coined it, yeah. I mean, they had called themselves the new Canadian Air Force, I think. Somebody had coined it already, but then that was the stamp on it right there. Yeah, when it ends up in print, that's what everybody calls them. And they are like the hottest thing in skiing and everybody wants a piece of them. And I think towards the end of that second season filming with them in Whistler, the degenerates here, MSP sends Gaffney to Whistler to capture what the new Canadian Air Force was doing for their movie Sixth Sense, and you're filming for Degenerates, but when another crew comes to Whistler to film your talent, did that bother you at all? I mean, it should have bothered me more than it did, but it it really didn't. I think that was just kind of my nature. I think I've always been that way. Like, you know, I wanted the guys to be like super exclusive, but at the same time, it's blowing the industry up, not just the company if that makes sense. Yeah. So I remember we were planning on doing some stuff. And and of course, the guys too, you know, they were like, well, MSP is huge. We should be in it, especially Douglas. I remember Douglas was, you know, he's a businessman. He wants to get more exposure. And I couldn't blame him at all. I, I, there's no way I would say no, you know, like those guys wanted to get out there a little bit more. And so I remember Gaffney you know, saying, hey, we're coming up there. Do you mind if we come and film the quarter pipe with you? And I was like, nah, come on, let's go. And so we collaborated. It was like Tom Erickson, who is still a good friend of mine, and we talk all the time. He was one of their filmers originally. And yeah, so it was like a super cool collaboration. And then Tom ended up coming out with us on some shoots as well. Like we had some backcountry shoots. It was actually on mountain, but again, it was like side hill. So it was kind of like backcountry. Nobody went over there. Yep. And there were some jumps that we made that were pretty influential. And they were in the MSP film. And so was the quarter pipe. But Shane was as loyal as it gets, you know, at my side, always with poor boys and helping us as a team create cool movies. And JP was very much the same way. And so, you know, I always had... 90% of their time, and we traveled together. We were best friends. It was a match made in heaven. Awesome, man. Well, with Degenerates, was that the first time you had Tanner in your movies as well? Because I know I think that the next year you had a full segment with Yuri. He was a lot more a part of the movie. But how did you meet Tanner, and what was he like as a little kid? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Tanner was a ball of energy, but the first time I met him was because of Shane Zox. And he was like, hey, dude, there's this kid. His name's Tanner Hall, and he's like 13 years old or 14 years old. He's he's a Grom. He's over at Smart's camp across the way, and he rips, but he's really into what we're doing. And you should probably go check him out. And so I filmed with him just a hair. You know, we met up. I was like, oh, this kid's cool. We rode the lift a bunch of times. We filmed for a day or two, and I already knew he was a superstar after one day. I was like, one day with that kid, and I was like, holy moly, this kid's going places. He was super young, fiery, and not scared to send it. So you meet him at summer camp, and summer camp really Mm -hmm. is like where the progression of culture and tricks and everything in the sport kind of happened. Shane Zox started High North Ski Camp. Were you there for that first camp? Oh, yeah. I was there for a bunch of camps in a row. I would spend time there and You know, we had so much summer footage in our movie every year because skiing was growing so fast at that moment that I was the trick guy, right? I wasn't a location guy. I was like individuals and progression. So summertime was like, you could throw it all on the line. It was soft. It was perfect. 
We had quarter pipes, we had jumps, we had rails, we had everything. So there was a lot of summer footage from summer camps. With the trick progression that's happening, is it like every day there's a new grab and a new rotation and you're there to document it all? Literally every day. I used to just sleep on wherever couches or inside the hotel rooms on the, the pullout cot. I think I was in your guys' room once. Probably. I think I slept on the floor in your guys' room or something, <laughs> some pullout couch or something. I would do anything I could to stay up there as long as I could. I would stay like three weeks up there in summer camp, just going every day up the hill, up the hill, and something new would happen. Or some guy like Candy Tovex would show up and, you know, he would come and just blow it up. Do you remember the first time you saw that guy ski? Because, I mean, if you look at skiers today, I don't think anybody touches what he's putting together footage-wise. And this is 25 years after you first saw him. But did he stick out? Is this a young kid, too? Like, where you're like, oh, my God, this guy's style is so fluid? When someone first brought me to Candide, I was like, whoa, who in the world is this kid? Because there were summer camps, like, all over the place, right? So it was like smart high north and then um what was the other one on the other side of the glacier camp of was, champions uh, camp of champions and i saw candida camp of champions and i was like who's this guy like dragging his arms behind him like one arm behind him la lazy on the ground kind of thing and he had just the coolest style ever and they were like that's candy tovex i was like who the hell is candy tovex the cool part is that he was a fan he liked poor boys you know he liked what we were doing he was into it he was part of it he wanted to do this. Like, he was all about it. Just like Julian Renier Laforge was like, he was all about it. And he was JP's best friend. So I got introduced to the Europeans through JP. And they were game changers, those guys. Being on the glacier with all these game changers, is it one of those things where the progression kind of goes week by week by week and you make sure you're the last person on the glacier because the last person on the glacier is going to get the most progressive tricks? Yeah. If there was one guy left on the glacier that was going off, I would be there. And I'd, I would always be like, oh, it's the best light anyways. Man, I wanted to film everything. I filmed so much. And I used to do follow cams on the glacier and just go crazy. And I filmed morning till dark, till they kicked us off the glacier. We'd be the last guys on the glacier. Sometimes we'd have to hike out of the glacier. <laughs> And then if you think about your career, the next film that you make is 13. And with this one, it's more trick heavy than Degenerates was. I mean, there was none of the comedy or any of the lifestyle that we saw in Degenerates. Was that on purpose just to showcase the progression of skiing? Yeah, I think we're just to the point where we were just like, let, it was just as hardcore as you could get. I think that's what was cool about Degenerates. You know, we had these funny setups and we had all this kind of stuff. But 13 was like, okay, we're hardcore into the movie filmmaking business now and I was like, I'm going to make this a living, living. Like, I'm going to make money at this. And this is going to work. And we're going to have massive distribution. And these guys are the bomb. And this is as fun as it gets. And 13 was, I don't know, that was one of my favorite films. The progression was so high. We met the new member of the Canadian Air Force, which was Falou. He was introduced to us through Kusan and through Oakley as well. They were like, hey, we got this guy. And he's really good. And he showed up and I think it was at the U.S. Open again, early season. And he did a switch backflip. And I was like, yep, he's on the program. Another thing that made a lot of your movies stick out to everyone, I think, was the music. And, you know, Stumpy maybe was like the originator of kind of having cool music in his movies. But that was in like the 80s. With your movies, it was pretty much music that the athletes wanted for their section. And it was the Wild West in the beginning. And when you think about music and especially music licensing, could you use whatever you wanted in the beginning? Like you ask no questions and just use whatever you wanted? Not really. It was kind of like gnarly. I was scared like the guys from MSP would like turn me in or something. So I was always re actually trying to get music. I licensed so much stuff and we spent a lot of money on music. But there was some funny loopholes in music too that you could have. Like you may get an okay like okay, that guy said we could use their music, right? And you had an email that said, yes, you can use it. But then you had to do the paperwork. And we'd just be like, well, we can't afford that. Be like, yeah, but we got a yes. All right, just don't do the paperwork. And if it comes back to us, then we'll do the paperwork. So like, there's some loopholes there that, we, you know, we, we try to get away with. And then sometimes, you know, we used bands that were super good, but maybe sometimes weren't as popular. 
So we tried everything. We reached out to everyone. And I had this guy named Chad Davis. I remember Chad. Yeah, Chad Davis was a music licensing guy. And he was like the best. And he was the coolest. And he did Taylor Steele. And he did other guys. He did amazing movies with licensing. And so we used Chad. And he would give me the thumbs up or thumbs down on everything. And sometimes the athletes would force my hand into praying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how important was the music selection to the athletes? I mean, were they like hell bent on, I need this song that matches my image? Or were they letting you dictate what they skied to? Well, a lot of times I chose music and I was like, do you like it? And he's like, oh, I'd rather have this. Or I was like, dude, just trust me on this one. And because the athletes were editing with me, it was made it a lot easier. Right. So one thing that I don't know if a lot of people knew, but like a lot of the athletes would come to the house and there'd be five people at my house all summer. Like crashing all over your house, surfing half the day, and then editing with you half the day? Yeah. Editing through the night and then surfing. JP, I remember him and Tyler used to like edit all night. And it, like before they'd go to bed, they'd go surf. And then they would go to bed. That's it was crazy. crazy. I was like, you guys are out of your mind. But I was the daytime editor and they were the nighttime editor. And with music, like how much is the most you think that you ever had to spend on a single song? Back then, probably like. 2500 bucks. So that's reasonable. I think today it'd probably be a lot more if you wanted a, a banger song, I would think. Yeah. I mean, if you want to put a full soundtrack together now, it's like really expensive. When you think about the editing process and everybody being at your house in California, do you ever have the situation where a movie comes out, an athlete might not have been in the editing process or just didn't know exactly what the final product looked like and ended up being pissed off because they weren't happy with how it came out? Sure. That's happened lots of times. I remember pretty funny stuff because you know what? The thing is, I don't blame them. You know, a movie segment in those days equaled sponsorship, right? It equaled the chance to win a award at the end of the year, which were very valuable back then. Like I really thought awards were valuable. If you won movie of the year, if you won, you know, skier of the year, if you won trick of the year, all those awards were super valuable as, as an athlete, and they transcended into dollars. Right. Plain and simple, they transcended into dollars. So you wanted to win one of those awards. You wanted to be at the front of a movie, or you wanted to be at the back of the movie, right? You, you wanted to close it because you're the closer, or you wanted to open it because you're the opener, which means those are probably the two best segments in the whole film. Probably. And I remember, like, Dane Tudor was pissed because we put him in the second slot and not at the end. I think he thought he was going to be the closer or the opener. He definitely deserved to be one of those spots, but sponsorships and other things started taking over and kind of getting in the way with a little bit of that stuff. So it gets political, huh? It does because we're trying to make a living too and we're trying to keep our sponsors. And now I'm, you know, running a payroll of $30,000 a month, which back then was like massive. And you're doing what it takes to, keep the machine rolling rather than just being super hardcore and not caring. At that point, we were caring about business sides of things. And I remember he was freaking pissed. I think he like pushed Cody or punch Cody or something. Oh, <laughs> man. Cody's like, what is me, dude? <laughs> That's pretty funny. But Cody was editing or something. But, you know, no hard feelings. We've always had like crazy stuff happen. You know, Pete Alport was fiery and he's gotten in fights with athletes before on trips. But it's part of the game. It's all about passion. It's only passion. Pete's such a fanatic of, he works harder than nearly everyone else. So he would get fiery when people didn't work as hard as him or they talk shit back to him or something. You know, he'd be like, what? Talking back to me? I'm the man. <laughs> it's time for my second round of sponsors. And I'm going to start with Outdoor Research. Well, I love that they sponsor my podcast. I've been wearing OR gear since I moved to Seattle in 2000. I started with one of their rain jackets, as if you live in Seattle and don't own one, you're doing things wrong. And based on how amazing that jacket worked for me, Outdoor Research Gear is the only outerwear I've bought with my own money. And I've been privileged over the years, I get a lot of free stuff, but I've still bought my gear from OR because it's the best. These days, while they've brought in new designers and the styles and the cuts have gotten cooler and more my style, one thing that won't change is the quality. That's the reason you see core skiers and snowboarders, climbers, and now mountain bikers swearing by OR. 
because if you want the best, head on over to OutdoorResearch.com to see what I'm talking about. My final sponsor this round is Best Day Brewing. And if you're like me, you love having a cold one, but you don't have the time for the alcohol to slow you down. That's where Best Day comes in. Think all the flavor of your favorite beer, whether that be a Kolsch, a Hazy IPA, a Mexican Lager, the Shandy, or the brand new Pilsner, which is quickly becoming my favorite Best Day, and they come guilt-free. As Best Day has a fraction of the calories of your regular beer, they won't stop you from driving anywhere, and you won't be hungover in the morning. And for people who drink beer with alcohol, here is my secret trick to extending my night. Mix in a Best Day every couple drinks, and you'll find yourself to be more coherent, more fun, and primed to have your best day or night ever. Trust me, it definitely works. And to find out more about Best Day, head on over to bestdaybrewing.com or buy some on Amazon. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Have you ever pushed an athlete to a point where something bad happened and then you feel guilty about it? Um, Pat Fujas in Sonora. And he did the biggest seven I've ever seen in my life. It was, it was like a hundred foot seven. And he ragdolled like 20 times, flip-flopped. And then he went back, stomped the seven, and then proceeded to land backwards. Well, he did like switch cork, and then he did five, but it was freaking big. And he, it was corked out, and he did it both directions. And I was like, this is another moment of skiing history. Yeah, was that the trip where his eye almost swelled shut after? No, that was in Europe. Okay. That was like this crazy gap that the guys from the mountain showed us, and it was way too big, way too gnarly, and he still hit it. Maybe that's the one that I would definitely regret pushing Pep towards. <laughs> that might actually be the moment. I was like, we got to hit this, dude. They built it. We got to hit it. Let's hit it. And then he flew over that thing so freaking far and put his knee to his eye, and he just walked straight up to me and was like, into the camera. <laughs> oh, that was bad, actually. But yeah, and, and you know, guys like Tyler Hamlet came into the Poor Boys crew through Pep. And I remember the guys at Oakley telling me Pep was going to be something special. And then Pep, of course, became something ultra special. And then Pep was like, hey, I got this guy. He's my good friend. He's from Steamboat. And he wants to just like film me and then give you the footage. But you got to meet him. And I was like, okay, whatever. And then I met Tyler at my house. He said like three words the entire time. <laughs> he came over. He was like, sup? Yeah, cool. I was like, all righty, you got the job. <laughs> he showed me the footage on like a VHS tape and he was shooting 16 millimeter, which I was like super stoked on. He's like a film school guy too, like classically trained. Straight out of Brooks College Film School. He had more knowledge than I'll ever have, still does. So he ended up coming on board and helping create the next 15 films and he killed it. But he was another hardworking guy, like gnarliest worker ever. Okay. And before we get ahead of ourselves, because we did, and I'm going to talk about know, propaganda. Sorry. It's okay, man. The movie that leveled you guys up even further was Propaganda. And the feature everyone talks about was The Loop. And I interviewed Anthony Bornowski a while ago. And I remember him talking about The Loop. And there was like a bunch of drama behind it. And I was planning on going back and listening to the drama, but I didn't. So what was the story behind The Loop? The loop took like a month. It was not supposed to take a month. But I had become friends with Kurt Heine, speaking of the snowboard industry. Kurt and I became really good friends, and we were sharing features. He was the main cinematographer for Mac Dog Productions back in the day. Do people want to share features? It's a weird thing to think that skiers and snowboarders sharing features. Is there a reason to share? Is it like a cost thing? Or is it just like he's cool and he doesn't care about skiers hitting his feature? No, it was definitely like we became friends. One day he was like, you know, this is kind of expensive, but we could share it. And I said, yes. And then I was like, huh, this guy's cool. We became friends. He's like, oh, I don't care. Snowboard skiers, whatever, dude. You know, let's go. And we started sharing everything. And we created the biggest quarter pipes ever built, you know, back in the day before anyone else built them. We built them. Huh. I would pay. He would build. And the loop was part of that. So... He was like, I'm going to build a loop, Johnny. And I was like, you're psycho. Really? Are you serious? He's like, yep, no one's done a loop in forever. They did one in the 70s, I think. And, you know, I was like, all right, let's do the loop. And JP was like, yeah, the loop. I'm doing the loop. And so he started building it. I don't know. He built it out of some weird construction plus snow. 
and his wife at the time was named Cynthia, and she was under it, and the thing collapsed. Oh. And it landed on her, and she broke her back, and she was buried. Holy shit. And Yeah, and if it wasn't for a shovel that was she was shoveling with, it was right next to her face when it collapsed on her. It created some sort of weird air pocket because it took him forever to get her out. I mean, imagine you're building a loop for a month with freaking machinery, and then the thing collapses. It's lucky she didn't die. So there was a lot of drama there. And JP knew that this was, like, really important for his segment. And Anthony, he loves Anthony, and Anthony was with us, and I love Anthony, and he was part of our crew, and he was like, I'm doing the loop too. You know, those were the two guys that were going to do it. Right. And the thing collapsed. They had to rebuild it. It took forever. Then there was bad weather, and they finally got it built, and there was bad weather again, and there was bad weather again. And JP was losing his mind. Literally, he was in Mount Hood for a month and he was starting to lose it. And he ended up getting shingles. Oh, he stressed out so hard he got shingles. So he had these like things all over his body that scarred him for life. And I was like, holy moly, it was heavy. And finally got rid of the shingles. And then Kurt called me. He's like, bro, it's going to be Bluebird. It's going to be freaking Bluebird. So I flew up there. Because I had left. I was like, I can't take this. I'm out of here. And sure enough, it popped blue and Anthony and JP were still there. They both sessioned it with the snowboarder. They had pads and they ate it over and over again. And then Anthony got one. It wasn't perfectly clean, but he got one. And that was really the first guy who made the loop. And then JP greased one super hard and he got one really good. And so he made the loop as well. And I think the photo that Kurt, so I was shooting video. Right. I was the, the cinematographer on it. Kurt was shooting photos. So I shot the video. I'm actually in the, if you look in the background of the propaganda, you'll see me. I'm in the background shooting. And then Kurt was the one who shot the photo. So it was pretty sick. It was incredible. It was a great shoot. The snowboarder made it as well. I forgot what his name was, but he made the loop as well. Did they get a cover of the snowboarder in the loop and a skier in the loop? Was it the same loop on two different covers or did they not use a cover? They didn't use it as the cover. We did a quarter pipe transfer with a rail. He used that as his cover. Okay. And JP, I put on the cover. The story broke is like JP did the loop first. But really it was it was kind of like Anthony did the loop first. Wasn't as clean the first one that I remember. But then he greased it as well, like really freaking greased it too. But Anthony's the first one to ride out of a loop in the modern era, and then JP did. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't know why there was drama behind that. Maybe it's because I created it, and it was like, JP did the loop. He's the first guy to ever do the loop. I think the drama was more like his wife breaking her back. Yeah, that was a lot of drama. Yeah. That didn't end well with, <laughs> he got divorced. <laughs> Does he blame it on the loop? No, I don't think so, but definitely didn't help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this whole collaboration was based on cost. And when you think about a feature back then, I mean, you're paying for cat time and a whole bunch of different things. How much does the loop cost you personally? I don't remember. It was thousands of dollars. And you're just paying it to like Kurt and then he's doing all the heavy lifting and hard work and then you get to just go hit the feature? Yeah. I mean, JP and those guys shoveled and chiseled and shoveled and chiseled day in and day out. Like, they were there. I was there, too, but not nearly as much as those guys. Like, they worked their asses off. And Kurt was, he was just a workaholic. So he, that's all he wanted to do is create things. And he made rails for us. Like, he'd be like, hey, you want to buy this rail? I was like, yeah. Okay, I'm going to make this crazy sea rail. It's going to be insane. I'm like, okay. And he'd be like, this is how much it costs. So I would pay for it. He would use it. So it's a win-win for everybody. You don't have to do any heavy lifting, but you get these crazy features, which is nice to have someone like a laborer like that that's that creative to do that shit for you. Yeah, he was a mad scientist. We always called him a mad scientist, for sure. And he was like an inspiration for many. And he did Heine tools and like he had all that stuff. So we collaborated and it was like the coolest thing because that was the collaboration of snowboarding and skiing for the first time, I think, back then. Like, I don't think anyone was collabing with skiing. No, 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 definitely not back then. Nah, Kurt was the open-minded guy who changed the perception of a lot of snowboarders, actually, that rode with us, you know, during those times. So, so it was kind of a groundbreaking kind of deal, too. Yeah, well, it's like you you paid him to collaborate with you and created a friendship with him all through that. 
But speaking of expenses, you guys eventually start spending money on helicopters. And I'm not sure if it started with propaganda, but thinking about helicopters, how much would a day of shooting out of a heli cost you? I don't even remember. It was so much money. Like 15, 20 grand? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. It was way too much money for us. I mean, we were, it was really expensive. But I know that Shane and JP and those guys and even Douglas and those guys, but they really wanted backcountry. And we were experimenting from the early days with snowmobiles, you know, into the backcountry. Yeah. We weren't MSP. I couldn't afford to be like heli all the time guy. But at one point I was like, okay, we got to do this. Like, I got to step up. I need to shoot 16 millimeter. I need to have better quality. I need to go into the backcountry. The guys want to go into the backcountry. They want to take the twin tips into the backcountry. They really did. They, that's all they wanted to do. So eventually I had to bite the bullet and buy some heli time. And I remember my very, very first trip to Alaska. I like, was planning this trip and I got a call from Steve Winter and he's like, Hey, I was like, whoa, <laughs> all right, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> and he's like, so we're going to go to Alaska. You're going to go to Alaska. We want to use Shane and Julian, and you want to use Shane and Julian, but we're going to take up Seth, and we're going to take up Kent Kreitler, and we're going to take, oh, no, it wasn't Kent. It was, uh, I forgot who it was, but it was, it was another one of those guys that was awesome. And he basically talked me into like doing the trip with him. So my first ever trip to Alaska was actually with Steve Winter. That's incredible. So you're collaborating all over the place. And I guess that's how you're able to get a lot of things done, which is pretty incredible. But you are still spending a shitload of money. I mean, when you think about heli time, even if you're splitting it, that's still a lot of money. And I would think sponsorship really helps offset those costs. And like... For you back then, what would a good year of sponsorship dollars be? Are you able to raise like 50 to 100 grand for a movie and spend that all on your travel and production? Or, or what would the number be that you're getting from all these brands? In the beginning, like it was a little bit of money. I remember my first ever sponsorship from Solon was 10 grand. Okay. I remember it distinctly. It was $10,000. And I remember K2 gave me five to have the writers in it. That was 15. And then I got from Oakley, I got another like five, you know, so I'm at 20. And then the next year, that was like the, the earliest of when my first sponsorship started happening. I think right. that was 13. And then the next year after 13, it started to kick in. And I remember Solomon gave me like, I think it was like 30 grand. And by session 1242, I remember it was like just over a hundred thousand dollars. I think it was like a hundred and twenty-five. Holy shit! That's amazing for a guy who's not known for his business acumen with the whole poor boys thing. That's a lot of fucking money to bring in. How stoked are you? I was stoked, and I should have bought a house or something. But <laughs> as typical as I've always been, whatever money came to poor boys at that time, back in those days, I spent every freaking dime on skiing and i remember propaganda for example propaganda i still think was one of the most sold films i've ever had it was back when they used to call on the phone and be like i'd like to order a movie yeah and we were selling 15 20 25 a day and i was like oh my god this is insanity because i was paying like three bucks for a vhs to get it done and i was selling it for 20 five or twenty six dollars wow you're making a killing dude i remember days where we sold 45 movies and i was like this is crazy we it was day in day out all day the phone rang and it was like the craziest thing ever i was like had someone just sitting by the phone at one point like just to pick up the phone call and like as many orders as you could take in a day it was insane and people would just send in checks just open the mailbox and there'd be a check. I was like, this is freaking crazy. So all that money that we made with propaganda, which was a lot, I spent on happy days, every dime of it. I remember before our first royalty check with like distribution, I had like $10 left. I was down to like <laughs> 10 bucks after making like $100,000. I was the year before, I was down to like 10 bucks. 
And I was like, I sure hope something happens right now. And I remember sitting in my house going, I can't even get gas in my car. And then like a day later, a royalty check came in the mail for like 10 grand. It was like a pre-sales royalty check from the company in San Jose at the time. Was that video action sports? Yeah, video action sports. And I was like, holy shit, it worked. All right, we can keep going. <laughs> so I had a $10,000 check and I just deposited that and kept life going because life was pretty simple. You know, I was single. I lived in a studio below Bo Bridges, a photographer. Yeah. And all the guys would just come over and edit and that would be that. It was awesome. Easy. And so at one point you're creating the movies yourself and you're selling yourself through the phone. Eventually, I'm sure that gets to be too much work. Is that why you go to a distribution house like Video Action Sports is just because they make it easy for you? Well, no, we just wanted to distribute. We wanted to get the movies out. The most important thing for me at the time back in the early 2000s, like, or let's say 98 even, to 2002, all I cared about was people seeing the film. That's it. Okay. You know, I just, I wanted to eat and be able to make another film. And that's literally all I cared about. There's nothing else. I just wanted people to see the film and like understand that this new wave of skiing was coming and we were on the forefront and we were the dudes. And then by 2003, it was a business, like straight up. I mean, after propaganda, it was a business. And happy days, it was like propaganda came out and then, it, well, the game, and then propaganda, then happy days. And happy days, we said happy days because of propaganda. So it was like propaganda came, we made all this money, we were ready to go the next year. I was like, and it was happy days. It was like as happy <laughs> as it gets. Our world was like going surfing and you Nolson was sleeping on the couch and he stayed a whole summer, an entire freaking summer out here. No way. Yeah. He stayed for like months, just surfing, living on the couch. Well, nowadays, I think you should go find his couch and go stay there because when he's not in Monaco, he's driving his Lamborghini. And when he's not driving his Lamborghini, who knows what he's doing? But what a <laughs> life that guy lives. That guy's made it pretty good. He's got funny stories, too. I've tried to get him on the podcast and I will try to get him on again. But I know I told you that we were going to go for an hour. And like always, we're not going to go for an hour because we're going a little bit longer. So I have to fast forward a little bit. I'm going to fast forward okay. to 2005. This is when a lot of things start changing for you. This is when you start shooting windsurfing and eventually you decide to make the windsurfing movie. And is it true that part of the reason you shoot windsurfing is because you help someone get their green card? Or what's the story behind that? <laughs> yeah. So... I was visiting Mikey Hill up in Oregon in the gorge, you know, Mount Hood area. And he's like, hey, come to this party thing. And I met this girl who lived in Maui and I ended up, you know, dating this girl from Maui. And so I went to a place that I said I didn't really ever want to go to, which was Maui, because it's windy. It's like the windy island. And I'm like, as a surfer, I was like, oh, the wind, it's the worst ever. So but I ended up going there. And, you know, we have good times dating her. And when I was there, I was watching the windsurfers because every day at like 11 in the morning, the wind would come up or earlier and it would just be all windsurfers and I couldn't surf anymore. So I would just watch them because she was a professional windsurfer. OK, so I watched her and I was watching all these other guys and I was like, damn, this is sick. And I actually I really enjoyed watching them and I couldn't believe what they were doing in massive waves. It was just it was it was like this eye opening, like, whoa, what the hell? This is insane. And then at one point she was like, I'm going to get kicked out of the country. Are you going to marry me? And I was like, no, <laughs> are you nuts? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then on New Year's Eve, I got pretty wasted and I was like, hey, I got a surprise for you. I'm going to marry you so you don't get kicked out of the country. And then I ended up marrying her to get her green card, which she did, but that didn't last long at all. Okay. We don't need to talk about her. We'll say that didn't last that long at all, like you said. And so you crushed it with the windsurfing movie because they don't have a movie like that. Like the way that you shoot and edit, windsurfing's never seen anything like that. Was the whole industry like, holy shit, this is like the second coming of what our sport's all about? Yeah, the windsurfing movie was cool. When I was in Maui, I met Jace Ponabianco, who became my partner and still is my partner to this day. And also I met a guy named Levi Cyber, who was one of the very best windsurfers in the world and especially wave sailing. He was like excelled to the max. He was the stylish, most epic rider ever who happened to love snow 
And he happened to love filmmaking. He was already making his own films. He was shooting on Super 8. And we started to hit it off just by hanging out, watching windsurfing. And I was like, oh, you're the dude who rips. And he's like, oh, yeah, my name's Levi. And so we ended up becoming friends. Jay's happens to be their filmmaker. He's the Johnny of skiing. He's the filmmaker of windsurfing. He's an ex-pro windsurfer who did the exact same route as me, but with windsurfing. And so I'm like, dude, I make films. You make films. We should make like a real film on windsurfing. And so I brought my 16 millimeter camera out and I started shooting. And I shot for like a year without knowing what I was going to do with it. And then we were like, okay, let's actually do this. And between Levi, myself, and Jace, we created the windsurfing movie, which turned out to be probably one of the greatest action sports films I've ever made. Really ended up being something special. And that's a bold statement coming from a guy like you who has made some incredible action sports films. So for that to be one of the best you've ever made, and it's your first stab at a windsurfing movie, given you're tied in with all the best in the world, it seems like, which is amazing. But one thing that I think might have happened, I don't know if it was during the windsurfing movie one or two, is that you found Kai Lenny and he was like 12 years old or something. And it sounds like you believed in Kai before Kai believed in Kai, before Kai's parents believed in Kai. And before we actually talk about Kai, were there any skiers that you found like that where you were like, you just saw raw talent and you were able to mold them into the pro that they became? Hmm, skiers. I mean... Uh, in my career, I remember something that I'll never forget was a day with Sammy Carlson. This is like one of the most radical days in my life, I think, as a cinematographer. That's actually like two days in a row that were like insane. But Sammy, I called Sammy Carlson. I was like, Sammy, we're going up into the backcountry today and we're going to do some stuff that is going to crush the world. And he's like, let's go. Let's do this. And I remember... I had my sled and it was just me and him. I couldn't even get a photographer to go. It was just nobody wanted to go except for me and me begging Sammy to go. But I didn't beg Sammy. He was into it. So Sammy and I went up on my, my sled. The arm fell off of the sled, like the sled arm. Yeah. It fell yeah. off halfway up. I was like, this is not starting out well. I hiked back down the trail and the thing was sticking up in the snow. It was just meant to be. And then I walked back to the sled and these sled neckers came by and were like, you should just do this. And they wrapped it up with something. The next thing you know, we went up and we found what was called Hollywood Ridge in Whistler. And Sammy dismantled Hollywood Ridge. He hit every single line and did things to switch, took off switch, did switch cork this and land switch cork that off of that ridge. And it was the most radical one day session I think I could ever remember. And then the next day we went up. And we built this crazy jump with Andy Mayer. And Andy did this nuts switch cork five over this giant, like, gappy, weird rollover thing. It was also kind of groundbreaking stuff. That day, I will never forget. I have it etched in my mind. Sammy going off the noses of Hollywood Ridge stuff and landing switch. It was just the sickest thing ever. And Sammy was probably, what, like 18? He was super young. And he went on to win, like... I mean, how many times has he won Skier of the Year? He turned into the backcountry phenom. You know, he wasn't just a park guy. He wasn't just a rail guy. He was backcountry guy. Yeah. And he turned into something freaking crazy special. So that's a day with Sammy. But in your career, you found Kai Lenny, right? Would that be fair to say? Yeah. And you believed in him before he and his family and anybody believed in him. You were like, this guy is special. Like, what made you think that about him? I don't know. There was something about Kai that I was like, this kid's got it. He's got what it takes. He's like, there's something about this little kid and he's a windsurfer and he's fearless and he's going to go places. I can already tell. And so I just kept filming him and never stopped. And his parents, you know, became good friends of mine in the end. But in the beginning, they were just like, this guy just doesn't stop filming my kid. You know, and I just I was like, he's a superstar. And they were like, he's a superstar. I was like, he's a superstar. And we put him in the film as a Grom. The first one. And then in the second windsurfing film, he was like, it was like his coming out party as like a, like a pro young kid windsurfer. It was insane. He went from like little kid to like man in no time at all. And then he just continued to go from there until he's one of the greatest watermen of all time. And when you think about developing a friendship like that, 
with you both loving the water. I mean, is it one of those things when you see Kai, like you and him, like go surfing together and like you're friends? Yeah, we're totally friends. He was over at my house last week. Oh, he man. came over a week ago or two weeks ago. He came, slept on my extra room in here, and we went up to the surf ranch together because he was doing something for Red Bull, and I was up there filming for Red Bull. So he's like, yeah, hey. I told him, hey, I'm going up for them, and he changed his flight and came to my house instead, and then we drove up together, and we drove down together, and we hung out. We went surfing, and my daughter and him went surfing at Trestles, and John John paddled out, and Kai made like a YouTube video and put my daughter in it, the whole deal. It was super fun. Man, you have to be the most rad dad to your daughter. Like, there's not too many people that can do things like that, which is pretty incredible. I will say that as time goes on, it's almost like you kind of handed the poor boy's keys to Tyler and went on different trips and, you know, select trips to film and stuff like that. Was it just that you needed a break or was that a hard thing to do or what, what was the reason for that? Tyler was great. He was just so on it. He was like such a good director and like... He wanted to do something more than just be a cinematographer. And, you know, it was good to like, okay, dude, you're the director of the film. You can put your name as the director. And the first film was Yeah, Dude, which he was like, I don't know if it went that great. I don't know if it went that great, but it ended up, it was cool. Pete freaked out. He thought it was awful. He was like, we should throw all the footage in the trash and tell everyone the house, the house burned down. You know, and Tyler was like, shut up, dude. So he made a really funny, cool, different kind of movie. And then from there, he started to really flourish. And then as a director, he became an incredible director and, you know, did amazing stuff. So Tyler became the right-hand guy of Poor Boys. He became Poor Boys, really. He was me from the early stages. He was me at the later stages, you know, and he did that. But he said to me, hey, I like working with you, not for you. (laughs) Never forget that statement. So if you were to name the top 10 most influential athletes to Poor Boys Productions, who would they be? Most influential skiers of Poor Boys would be Shane Zox, J.P. O'Claire, Mike Douglas, Vincent Dorian, J.F. Cousin, Philip Poirier, Sammy Carlson. I mean, I would be leaving a lot of people out in this group, but like there was a lot of really, really influential guys from Poor Boys. The early days and then the later days, you know, so Candied Tovex. Uh, who else was I going to say it just now? I had some other guys and dip my tongue. I think Sammy was such a big influence. I mean, obviously, Pep Fujas was like one of the biggest ever. And I would also say Yoon Olsen. Like that whole Oakley team. And then Vinny Dorian. Like those guys literally changed skiing forever. I think Dane Tudor did a good job of progressing skiing as well. I think he was a guy who actually progressed skiing. And that was with Jeff Thomas. Like, Jeff Thomas brought Dane to our program. Yeah, Jeff Thomas was great about bringing people to your program. When he came into Poor Boys, he brought, like, a whole new crew into the fold that all, like, stood out in your movie. Yeah, it was pretty sick. Yeah, he was a great talent scout, too. Yeah, he's no slouch, man. He's a great cinematographer, filmmaker. And I very much appreciate his input and his whole thing that came to Poor Boys because he's awesome. He also met me at High North Ski Camp, just so you know. He was a camper. He saw me filming. And he's like, I'm going to be like you, dude. I interviewed him. I think that story came up in here where he would like saw you and he's like, I'm going to be exactly what that guy is. That's crazy, huh? Yeah, it's so cool. I'm going to end the show here. We could talk about a lot more things, but I know I haven't respected your time this time like I did last time, so I'm sorry about that. But I did get another person to record three inappropriate questions for you. And this time it was a man of few words, a man that we just talked about, Tyler Hamlet. He was with you for over a decade at Poor Boys. These days, he's one of the best content creators in the business with Flagship Independent. And Tyler came up with three inappropriate questions. Are you ready for the first one from Tyler? Sure. All right, here we go. Hey, Johnny. Question number one. I was just curious. What was that missing or magic ingredient that was in those cookies that JF and Vinny made you so long ago do you remember some special cookies that jf and Vinny made you oh yeah yeah i remember it very well we were at shane zox's house whistler and it was going to be a really fun night everyone was super psyched to go out it was going to be snowing the whole night the whole next day so it was like this like saturday night or friday night let's go to the party and they all knew i was like into sweets so 
there was a big chocolate cake that got left on the counter and they cut it up and they had all these pieces. Like the cake was there, like half the cake was on the counter, like in the pan. And there was like five pieces on the counter and they were like, yeah, just take whichever one you want. And they purposely made one piece bigger than the other ones. And they knew, they knew I would grab that one. (laughs) And inside of that cake was an entire box of chocolate x lax oh no (laughs) yeah an entire box and of course i just thought the cake was crunchy because i was a sweetaholic i was like oh man i love cake and i love chocolate and so i ate the entire cake and as i was eating it they started videoing me and they're like how's the cake how does it taste and i was like okay there's something definitely wrong with the cake but i was already like three quarters of the way through and i was like dude you guys didn't drug me or something did you and they're like oh and they were laughing their asses off. Hey, Jody ate the cake. <laughs> and then eventually they were like, look at the counter, man. Look at the counter. And I looked over and I was like, what, what? And I was looking around and then I saw it. And I saw the box of x lax behind the cake. <laughs> and I was like, you freaking got to be kidding me right now. You guys just gave me, I could die from this. And I didn't feel it. For a while, so I just kept getting ready, took a shower, and right as I was about to go out the door, it was like, a girl, 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 girl. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, I'm not going anywhere. Oh man, that is amazing. I thought it was going to be something like weed cookies or something like that, but that's no. even worse, man. That is like terrible to ruin a night like that. But funny at the same time, I'm sure they all got a good laugh. We'll go to question number two. What is the craziest, dumbest thing you've had an athlete do on the road? I mean, you've seen it all and done it all so let's hear it the craziest thing i've ever had an athlete do on the road i mean has anybody ever gone to jail oh yeah people gone to jail for sure but that wasn't like i don't know the dumbest craziest thing i've ever had an athlete hmm oh i mean it would have to be like actually out of the job series poopies because poopies has done some really dumb things but only because of the limelight and fun behind it. But he's done some crazy stuff. So I would say Jamie O'Brien, Red Bull Show, Sean McInerney, Poopy, a.k.a. Poopies, he's done some crazy stuff. I would say he's drinking gutter street water straight out of a shoe to do a shoey. Dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. That would be it? Well, if you could only picture that in my mind right now, what he did, it's crazy. Yeah. Next question. On that Oakley trip in France, what made you grab your camera bag when everyone else left theirs in the van? And what footage was on the tapes? Huh. We were Oakley 1242. We had just filmed backcountry. Pep had just done two 540s, left side, right side. He did a zero spin, all backcountry. An all-landing switch that's going to change the game of skiing when people see it. Yeah, change the game of skiing. It was going to be part of his groundbreaking segment that was one of the best of all time. And we park to go eat at this restaurant. And we park in front of, like, in a roundabout kind of thing in Chamonix. And everyone leaves their stuff in the van. And I was like, man, this is weird. And... I have a weird feeling about this. And I was looking at my stuff and I was like, this is the most groundbreaking footage of all time. Why would I want to leave it in here? But I, it, I actually did leave it in the van. But what I did was I had this weird instinct and I tied it and I tied it so crazy. I tied it so you couldn't pull it out of there without taking all the skis out. And we went in to eat pizza or wherever we were eating just right down the road. And it was a big snowstorm. And like halfway through the meal, I jumped up, scampered across the table. Everyone was like, what is wrong with this guy? And I ran out the door with chicken skin and I ran to the van and the door was still moving like backwards. And everyone's stuff was gone except for mine. Is that why there's only one angle of those shots? Yeah, that was it. Steve Rosendahl was on the trip. He lost everything. Chris O'Connell lost everything all of his photos and all of his gear except for those photos that he had in his pocket he had a bunch of rolls in his pocket that he had in his jacket so he didn't lose that but 
basically, yeah, we lost everything except I had everything. So we still had the ledge. We still had the backcountry shoot. We still had everything. I didn't lose one roll, but I would have lost the entire trip if my stuff would have gotten stolen because it was all in there. Oh, man. Well, that's a total nightmare. I'm glad you were able to save your stuff. Sucks for everybody else. Everybody learns a lesson that day. Take your shit with you or lock it up. That's Inappropriate Questions. That's our podcast. And looking at your career, while you were able to make the whole pro skier thing happen, what you'll really be known for is making skiing cool. And while MSP and TGR were doing that too, your movies were focused on the youth and the progression and the energy that they brought to the table. And sure, a lot of those dudes graduated from poor boys to bigger production houses. But when they were young and they were really influential, they skied for you and they would run through a wall for you. And that's based on your California guy personality and the idea that you guys are the same type of person, mogul skiers who kind of transitioned into this new school. And really, I feel like you helped make this sport change almost more than anybody else in those early 2000s. So I want to thank you for that and thank you for what you've done. And thank you for your time, man. That's our podcast. You. Thanks, Mike. So that was time with Johnny DeCesare, and he's arguably the most influential filmmaker in skiing when it comes to the youth segment of things. Sure, there was TGR and Matchstick, but they catered to a little bit of an older crowd. And Johnny and his Poor Boys Productions always had his finger on the pulse of what was new and cool in skiing, and he always had the young and -and up-and-coming athletes who were really progressing things, and then a couple of years later, those skiers would end up in other films. But the talent and the progression that Poor Boys brought to the table on a yearly basis was undeniable. And while the Poor Boys brand never got as big as the other giants in the industry, Johnny was always worried about making cool shit and doing cool shit. And the business end of things, that wasn't always the focus. But you know what? That doesn't matter. He left his mark on the ski industry, and now he's doing the World Surf League thing. And it seems like life just gets better with age, and owning a business for Johnny, well, that would only act as an anchor for one of the nicest and coolest guys to do it in the ski world. That's the podcast. At this point, I want to ask you to review me wherever you listen. This really helps things grow in a way that I don't even understand. But a simple review or five-star rating really does help things. If you're on an iPhone, here's what you need to do. First, click the purple podcast icon. Second, search for the Powell Movement. And if you already subscribe, you still need to do this search. Third, click on my logo. Fourth, scroll down to the rating and reviews. And fifth, star rate me. And if you're really awesome, please write a review. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for listening. And please, please, please support my incredible sponsors. I only work with the best, and they are Outdoor Research, Elon Skis, Best Day Brewing, Stanley, and Club Med. Have a great week, everyone.